me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Anyway, glad to have you here. And those of you watching live streaming, I just welcomed you even though you didn't hear it. So uh, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, I'm going to go over a, a couple of the announcements. I won't go over all of them. First of all, softball people, we are having softball practice this evening, 4 o'clock um, at the Booster Field. So come on out for that. And those of you who want to come out and watch us Tuesday uh, at the game, we'd love to have you. We are having a good time. And uh, we're winning games. We're not winning all of them, but we're winning games. So it'll be a fun thing to come on out. And so we encourage you to do that if you would. Uh, also, uh, this evening at 7 o'clock, there's a deacons meeting, and it's an open meeting, so anybody who wants to attend can, but especially you deacons, if you'll be there, 7 o'clock. We don't have a lot to go over, but we do have some. Also, probably, I won't guarantee it'll be that Sunday, but probably um, the last Sunday of the month, uh, we'll have a church, short church business meeting. We've got two that are in our Constitution that are sort of mandatory. We have one at the first of the year in January to approve officers and teachers and budget and all that type of stuff. But in the middle of the year, we like to see if anything's going on and give an opportunity if anybody's got anything they want to bring up with a church business. So uh, we'll be in touch with exactly what date that is in, in um, June, but that's coming up. Um, Donna and I... Uh, we'll be married uh, on this coming Saturday for 40 years. We dated two years, so uh, that means 42 years together in some form or fashion. You give her an applause. I know you're not applauding me. You're applauding her. But anyway, she she deserves a weekend away, so uh, we're going to be going somewhere. But God will be here, and God's going to be using Steve to preach, and so you'll enjoy that very much. So invite people to come out, and uh, we'll be gone for that. Thirsty Thursdays, um, you can see the meeting there about that. You can see about the pregnancy center dinner. Do you want to say anything about helping with the shingling? All right, so if you'd like to do some work, as unto the Lord, help this widow out. And I think it's always good to partner up with other churches in doing something that, that's good like that. So do that. You can see that we'll just mention it briefly, the treasure hunt on the afternoon, evening of the 27th. So uh, be planning for that. Any other uh, announcements that need to be made at this time before we go to prayer requests? All right. Got several prayer requests. You can see the ones um, that are there. Um, got several others that, that are coming up. Sandy back there, uh, her uh, neighbor, Lorraine's brother, passed away, and, and she's asking prayer for uh, that. Also, um, uh, Janice asked special prayer for her son Jeff, still not doing well. He's in the hospital in a lot of pain, and they're not really right now knowing what to do much to help him. So she asked him. Also, uh, Lauren Doty's oldest sister, uh, Chris, has uh, got a physical need. Help me out remembering which, what it was. Right. Right, not getting enough oxygen uh, and her iron's extremely low, so she's having some physical difficulties. Also, um, Bubba's uh, great nephew had a four wheel or accident and he's messed up pretty bad, so uh, he has prayer for him. Any other prayer requests that you want to make known? Yes, Nancy? Yes, um, Donnie Rose family. Uh, Donnie passed away yesterday morning. Okay, Donnie Rose fan. R O S E. He um, was doing some work. It's Rose Hauling from Barbersville. Uh, Rose Hauling in Barbersville. Yeah. And anyway, he went out and decided there was something that he'd said for several days that, you know, this needs to be done. And right. he went out and was driving some kind of piling or something. Uh -huh. 
and had a heart attack and fell into the creek. He was 80? About 80. He was 80. Somewhere early 80s. Okay, and just had a heart attack when he was out working. Yeah. We'll pray for that, uh, Donnie Rose. Family. And his wife, Chris, is not well either. So. Okay. Pray for Kevin also, uh, Blevins, as he's traveling to Florida. He'll be gone two weeks on work assignment, so uh, remember him. Uh, yes. Cheryl uh, Sage? Yes. She's saying very sick. Please pray. Right. Excuse me. Uh, she's on our prayer request list, and I knew that uh, she and also her brother have pneumonia, uh, and so evidently she sent in because she's watching. Uh, especially pray for her. She's uh, real, real sick. Uh, remember those that are uh, normally struggling with things. Yes, John. Uh, you all remember Joe Miller? Well, yes. He, he's uh, up in Pennsylvania now. He's been up there a while. He had some trouble. At first, they thought he had cancer of the jaw. Right. So all kind of complications. The whole town talked to him quite a while at one time, and then Mary Lou. But they found out he had some sort of rare blood disorder. A rare blood disorder. Yeah. Continue to pray for Joe Miller. We are thankful that Johnny's back with us because he was on the first day doing well, so thank God. Uh, you know, there are those that, that uh, hadn't been here and because of physical things. We know Fred. Uh, think of uh, um, Leon Fincher and others that are struggling. Thank you when you have some challenges that you fight through them and come to church. Uh, uh, number one, that honors the Lord, but... Uh, um, that's, that's quite an honor that you enjoy the fellowship here enough where you're willing to fight through some challenges to be here. So we uh, appreciate you coming. Any other prayer requests? Yes. What you talk about that, because I tell you, y'all have said it before, but you never know what other individuals are going through. Right. And, and that's why you fellowship with one another, not just, you know, uh, running out after church. You know, take time to... Catch up with one another, and if you've been praying for somebody, let them know and just uh, get a get a report on how they're doing. I always, if I'm praying for somebody, I try to at some point say, you know, how's it going? Because I want to know my prayers are doing something uh, beside hitting the top of the roof. I want to know that God's hearing it and He's uh, at work in those things. All right. Anything else before we go, Lord, and pray? Pray always for our country. Pray for. Uh, Christians to be willing to take a stand because more and more uh, that's uh, coming under fire. Yes. The enemy has been coming against us as a family just really hard. I know it's because his days are numbered. And so I, I, this is just comfort that God has given me that I wanted to share when you've walked through so many difficulties so many times, just over and over, it's still that feeling of, oh, this is so hard, and Lord, you got to give me strength so I can get through this. Uh -huh. But you feel it. God yeah. is so faithful. When you're walking through hard things, just stop and take a breath and just remember he's got you. I love, and most of you probably at some time or another had it in your home or been in a home that's had it, the, um, the uh, little poem story, Footprints, about the two sets of footprints and then uh, there being only one and the person asked, you know, why, Lord, during the hardest times of my life were there only one f f set of footprints? Did you leave me? And uh, in the, the poem, it says, My child, I love you, and I would never lead you. Those were the times that I carried you. That's why there was only one set of footprints. So, yeah, when we take time to acknowledge, Lord, um, you're never more out of control than when you think you're in control. But you're never more in control when you know you're out of control, but God's in control. And that gives you a peace that everything's going to be fine. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a good way to sort of set up for praying as a congregation and talking to you. And I pray that people are talking to you uh, and not necessarily listening to me. But, Lord, you're a God that carries us. 
you know our burdens, you know the things that, that you uh, didn't send into our life, but you have allowed in our life. Because, Lord, your plan for it is to turn it to good. Good doesn't mean easy, but it does mean good. And, Father, we can rest in the assurance that if you were willing to die on the cross for our sins, that you would not withhold any good thing from us as we are walking in obedience to you. And so, Lord, we want to see Satan kicked out of our lives. We don't want anything that Satan's trying to do in our life. And we don't want to cooperate with him by having doors of sin in our life where we're not doing something we should be doing or we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. We, we want to be blessable and, and not see Satan being able to kill, rob, and destroy. And so we bring our needs to you. We, pr we pray for physical healing. Thank you for the ways you've been working. I want to thank you for those that are still in the midst of physical challenges, Lord, that you're with them. And help them realize that you feel their pain. You suffered for them to have grace and mercy. And Lord, you will give them what they need day by day. So help them to trust you and continue to reach out to you. Pray for those who need wisdom. Lord, also pray for those who are hiding. Many times it was already said, Tom said it, you know, but we don't know what's privately going on in people's lives, but you do. And Lord, hiding from things, hiding challenges and struggles, hiding whatever, Lord, never good. You told us to bring our need to the cross. You told us to share with brothers and sisters in Christ that know how to pray and watch you bring a greater deliverance than you ever could if we didn't share it. And so, Lord, we pray for that. I pray for our country. Lord, uh, one of the things that... Uh, I'd like to thank you for, Dow brought it up today, that it's uh, uh, an anniversary of the landing uh, on the beaches uh, on D-Day. I want to thank you for the lives and the individuals who died so that we might continue to have the freedom that we have. And Lord, we pray for uh, their memory and their legacy that it, be something that is, they didn't shed their blood in vain, that we'll be faithful in uh, walking in the freedoms that they fought for us to have. Lord, I pray for this service. There are people who need to hear from you. There are people who have spiritual needs. And Lord, we all need to enjoy the beauty of your holiness and your presence. So, Lord, be with us. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody here for the very first time? Do I have anybody here for the very first time? All right, here you go. There you go. Appreciate that. Keep inviting people. I know people are out on vacations and stuff like that. So uh, um, mm, we miss them, but invite people. All right, we're going to do some singing as unto the Lord. So worship team, y'all come on up. You say we're going to add somebody to the team today? Tom. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tom can make a joyful noise. Oh. <laughs> I, w I just was also reminded this week, somebody was commenting on my children. And then it, it, it made me think about because I knew Kevin was going to be leaving to, to go to on his business for two weeks and I was just praying and, and God put it on my heart I remembered the how I didn't want to take care of kids with autism and it was I, I kind of 
just bucked it. It was like when your parents tell you to take out the trash or make up your bed, and you go, why do I have to do that? I don't want to do that. And that's how I acted for a while. But now, my perspective is different. And that is so important. It's the perspective that you see. Now, my perspective is, God, who am I? Who am I that you would give them to me? That I would get to see the miracles that you work through them all the time. And so that's how I am with the, the, the hard things that we're walking out and some stuff that transpired last night. And who am I, Lord, that you would carry me through these things? So where's your perspective? Where's your perspective? Because God is faithful. You just have to see it through his eyes. So stand and praise him with us because he is so worthy of our praise. He's so worthy. Stories of what good brings your life, but I've heard the tender whisper of love. Dead of night, and you tell me that your peace and that I never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who I 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to
draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore.
seated. While the children's church workers go to the back and then young people follow them out, got uh, one or two thank yous I want to do. Thursday, I walked off my final field as a coach, as soccer. And I'd like to thank my wife for uh, supporting me and uh, allowing me to coach and, and do and uh, for the 22 years of coaching. And I also want to say a thank you to my congregation. I know that my congregation prays for me. And it's not the one lost record. That, that to me, uh, is not what I want to thank you for. I coached because it was a venue that I could speak truth and to people's lives. And this last Wednesday, I had my last time of having my soccer team over to my house. And uh, we cancel always the last practice of the season before we could be eliminated. And, of course, it was the last game on Thursday, so we didn't have practice. So I could tell them while I coach. And the reason I coach is to earn the right to share with them Jesus Christ. And ultimately, I will feel like I have failed as a coach if my players don't make it to heaven. Now, ultimately, I can't make them choose that. But my desire, my prayer is for every single young person that I ever coached to see them in heaven. I know I uh, was very honored. The, uh, one of the uh, players that I coached happens to be the boys' varsity coach. And uh, I'd spoken into his life as a young man when he, you know, through the years of coaching him in JV and varsity. Went through with him when uh, one of our players, Joe Stanley, had a car wreck and died. And I can remember he was a part of that team and looking them in the face and reminding them that eternity is only a heartbeat away. And being ready for it is the most important thing. And... Over the years, uh, I've had opportunity to uh, be with his family when they've had tragedy of death in their family. But anyway, um, he was there and um, um, at the game, at most of the people, almost everybody had gone. And I always stayed at the end to make sure our bench is clean and everything. And I was getting ready to take my equipment and he was still standing at the fence. And, you know, he thanked me for... Uh, the things but I remember looking at him and I said I want to talk to you uh, just for I want to say something to you as a as a friend to a friend I said I want to see you in heaven he smiled we shook hands and I walked away up to this point I don't know that he's clean to know the Lord but those are my desires and I want to thank you for your prayers I want to thank you that what God does lasts forever and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't do that. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. We'll continue our study in Mark, starting at verse 29. And uh, through the section uh, to the end of this first chapter of Mark, uh, it talks about some different things about ministry. 
about the facets of ministry. And so we're going to be looking at this, uh, starting at verse 29 of Mark chapter 1. And forthwith, when they were, were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon, or that means immediately, they uh, tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. In verse 29 it says, And when they were come out of the synagogue. Do you know what happened at the synagogue that day? There was a man that had been possessed of a demon, and God had set him free. There had been the mighty power of God demonstrated in the church that day. But I want to tell you that if ministry doesn't make its way back to your home, then somehow we as a church are failing, and ministry fails. Ministry starts at home. Ministry is what happens behind closed doors. Many times... People come to church and they put their best faces on, put their best clothes on, and try to hide the things that are going on behind closed doors. That should never be. That should never be in a good church. We should be as honest and real and sharing our struggles and needs with one another. And as we come together co corporately to worship the Lord and God does things in here, it should flood its way back to our homes. It should affect how husbands deal with wives and children, how wives respond to their husbands, how young people respond to their parents. Because if our nation is going to change, it starts with individuals getting right with God. And individuals taking it to their homes and getting their homes in line with the Word of God. I wonder if on a given week, if I could be a fly on the wall in your house, what would I see? What would I hear? What would you be trying to hide that you wouldn't want anybody religious to know goes on? And so if we're going to minister, if we're going to be effective, it's got to be real. It's got to be something we live out in the four walls of our houses. And it flows to each one of the ministry uh, 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 in our house that we minister to. Somebody's always sick in a family, and I'm not talking about just physical sick. I don't know about you, but as a parent, it's a very rare thing when all my children are clicking on all cylinders and there's no storms on the horizon and everything is sunny and they're just going great guns and it couldn't be better. Somebody's always struggling with something. Somebody's always not exactly where they should be spiritually. Something is always in need in a home. And we need to be aware and do the ministry. And first thing I want you to understand at ministry at home, <clears throat> I could say this is especially for wives, but it applies to all of us. You can't change them. You're not the answer. You can't fix them. Their mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. He and his wife, if they could have done something about her sickness, would have got her well already, but they can't. And do you know what? You can't fix a single person in your home. My wife can't fix me. Trust me, she's tried to let me in a time. And she's about understood that it takes an almighty God to change this boy. And if he doesn't do it, there's not a thing she can do about it. And that's true with our kids. Many times as you raise your kids, you think, I can make you do. Oh, you may, when they're young, make their outside do what you want them to. But inwardly, where's their heart at? You can't make their heart do. You can't make their heart be soft toward God, toward the things of God. That's a personal choice that they've got to make. And our challenge is to understand we can't heal the sick people in our family. Well, what can you do? Well, what did they do? They made sure that Jesus was in the house. When Jesus came home with them from the synagogue, when they brought Jesus with them and he was real to them and he's a person. Do you know that Jesus is a real person? 
Do you know that his spirit, not just pretend, Jesus can come to your house. He's there already. But he'll stand at the door and knock as far as being able to minister until you let him in and let him know, God, I can't fix this person. I can't even change me. I need you. God, there's something. And begin to take up a prayer burden. And I will tell you that the way if you're going to minister to people in your house, it starts with you putting them in God's hands in prayer constantly. Many times we get in God's way trying to play Holy Spirit rather than being guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Making sure God's the one who's working on the heart instead of us. And so in this situation, they... Basically said, Jesus, my mother-in-law is sick. Jesus, my mom's sick. She's got a fever and we can't help her. Do you know it's nothing for Jesus to change a life that's ready to be changed? It's nothing for Jesus to work in a person's life to get them to that point to be changed. Sometimes God's got to get somebody at the end of their rope where they're desperate for God. It's amazing to me how much pain people will put up in their life before they truly get desperate enough to say, God, I turn it over to you. I turn it over to you. It'll never be fixed if it's up to me. But I turn it over to you. But for Jesus, it was just a matter of a contact, a point of contact. If I could just like the lady with the issue of blood, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just have contact with the real Jesus, it would change everything. It's no problem for Jesus to change anybody in your family, in any situation. And God's big enough, and so he's the one we need to go to. And so Jesus took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. Here's what I want you to see. When the fever left her, what did she do? Well, look at the verse. She started ministering unto them. Can I tell you what happens in a home where Jesus Christ is allowed to minister to an individual? They start ministering to others. Don't you want your home to be a place where people are helping each other, meeting each other's needs? Being there for one another, building one another up with their words, with their actions, being sensitive to one another's needs, giving instead of expecting people to always do for them, understanding that God gave you the people around you so you could show them the love of God. If I'm the husband that I should be, my wife knows Jesus better because of the way I love her, the way I deal with her. If I'm the parent I should be, my children know Jesus better, understand how he loves and teaches and corrects by the way I deal with them. I draw them to the heart of God to know what God's like and minister Jesus to them if I have been ministered to by Jesus. And so in our homes, this is where ministry takes place or it's not real at all. It's, fo- fa- it's phony, it's fake. And that's what the world believes about Christianity because we're not cleaning up our own act and we're telling them how to clean up theirs. And we've got all types of things going on behind closed doors that is just sick and wrong. But anyway, as soon as she was lifted up, she ministered unto them. Um, verse 32. And at evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed of the devil. Now, to me, it's interesting that at evening because this was the Sabbath. So they weren't supposed to carry any burden on the Sabbath. So carrying sick folks to Jesus would have been wrong by the Old Testament law according to them. You know, we got some really warped religious ideas in our mind. But anyway, they, at evening, uh, for a Jewish day, it started at six in a day, started at six in the uh, in sunrise and goes to six in the evening, which is basically uh, sunset. So 
at this point in time, they're allowed to, to bring. So they brought him all that were diseased and them that were possessed of the devil. And all the city was gathered together at their door. The point I want you to see here is when you're ministering to people's needs in the home and word gets out that homes are being healed, people will come. Growth will take place. If we want this church to grow, we start by ministering at home and, and let that ministry flow through us to those around us. And God will begin to get the word out and people will come. When they knew that Jesus was there and that he was able to heal them, that ministry equals growth. And so, are we a growing church? And it's just not always about the numbers, and we're going to see that in a, in a minute. But if we're ministering, then people are coming. New people, people who have needs, and we're watching God meet their needs. Verse 34, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Now, we talked about this last sermon about Jesus uh, with the man who had the demon in him at church, and he told him to be quiet and come out. Here we are again where demons are trying to say, I know that you're, you're God. I know who you are. I know you're God. And Jesus didn't allow the demons to speak. My question is this. Why? Why did Jesus say in this situation not to speak? Here's why. And you're going to see it as I continue in the context of the verses. Numbers can sometimes cloud true ministry keep it from happening god meets people as individuals and sometimes as numbers grow we're more focused on uh, numbers and i want to show you this as we move forward that i'm just not about doing whatever we can to get butts in the seat and build a bigger church and fill that up and build a bigger church and fill that up and bigger church and fill that up Sure, I want people to come because it's hard to minister to people who aren't here. If they're not coming, it's hard to minister to. But I'm not after building numbers. I'm after seeing people's needs met. And there is a difference. Churches have gotten where they will do gimmicks and do all types of things to just to try to get people in the seat. They'll water down the preaching. Do you know some churches will spend an hour and a half in singing and only about 15, 20 minutes in preaching? because more people want to hear the music because that's appealing to your flesh. That's more enjoyable in their mind than sitting somebody sharing the word of God with them for 30, 40 minutes. And yet we got to adjust because we got to make sure numbers and we got to get people and we don't want to offend people. And, and I don't want to offend people either. But I will tell this truth. I'm not worried about numbers. If I'm preaching the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm ministering people and I'm watching God meet people's needs and people's lives are being changed for time and eternity, people who have a hungry heart will come. And we need to be careful not to water down our stances. And numbers is not, it can cloud the issues. And I'm going to show you why. Jesus was doing all this ministry in verse 34. Notice the next morning. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. And there prayed. Jesus said, I got to get alone. You know, some preachers are so busy doing the work of the ministry, they don't spend time with God to get God to work in them to do the ministry. I don't want to be a professional preacher. I want to be an empowered preacher. I want the fact that I've spent time with God and God's empowerment through this lump of clay that he's chosen. He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and that's me. I want people to know I've spent time with God and God's speaking to them. It's not Dwayne Pugh. 
has very little to do with Dwayne Pugh except to look past Dwayne Pugh to say, if God can use Dwayne, God can use anybody. And Jesus got away to a solitary place because it's not about crowds. It's not about numbers. It's about getting alone with God and doing business between you and God. And so Jesus got up. I put down here, prayer gives perspective for God's agenda. Now, most preachers would have said, wow, we had a great meeting last night. We're going to have another one tonight. Same thing, and more people are going to be healed, more demons are going to be cast out. We're going to grow, and we're going to get this movement going, and we're going to make it happen. Jesus got alone because he knew that he couldn't minister and didn't give out what God did not put in him. And as he got into a solitary place and prayed, he got God's agenda. And it wasn't to have another big healing demon casting out meeting that evening in Capernaum. Also, I want you to understand that nothing is going to take place in ministry without prayer laying the foundation. You know why this country's not changed? We don't lay down a real foundation of prayer for our country. If you read revivals in the past, in the history of the United States, there were people who would gather during their lunch breaks day after day. They wouldn't eat that lunch break, and they would pray, and they would pray, and they would pray, and they would pray until the power of God would fall and do something as they prayed. I don't know that we know how to labor in prayer. We don't know how to pray things into existence. There is a labor in true praying. And you can't minister anything else until there has been a foundation of a preparation before God in prayer. I thank God for the people in my life, starting with my mother and stories about my father and others that I've observed throughout my life that knew how to pray. And not just a short little prayer here and there. They knew how to get a hold of God. And they would stand at the door of heaven and knock until God said, okay, I've allowed Satan to test you to believe that I would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you're not ready to receive. I just wanted to see if you really believe that. And I've allowed Satan to test you, but you've continued to knock on the door of prayer. And so it's time for me to show you what your prayers have brought about. If God can only do what you ask for in prayer for five hours straight, what would God be doing in your life? I don't know how many of you have ever spent long times in prayer. Jesus got up a great while before day. I'm sure he had a busy day. He had a long day the day before. But he knew that he couldn't face another day and do what he needed to do without laying that foundation of prayer so that he could minister. He prayed. Verse 36. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they found him, they said unto them, Everybody's looking for you. Everybody's looking for you. You need to come back. What did Jesus say in verse 38? And he said unto them, Let us go into the next town, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. Once again, it's not about numbers and crowds, but I want to see Jesus had God's agenda. He said, there are other things that God wants to do today at other places. It's not about what makes sense to me. It's about what God has said do. And I've got to go and do something. Now, notice what he said the agenda was in verse 38. I need to go and heal people in another town and cast out devils. Is that what he said in verse 38? He said, I need to go to preach there also. That's why I came forth. 
preaching. You know, preaching is a foolish thing. Would you put up uh, the 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 23? If you're going to minister to people, you've got to preach the word. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. Oh, yes, you are. If you're saved, you're supposed to be proclaiming the truths of God's word. I want you to see that God is chosen by the foolishness of preaching to change people's hearts and lives. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. What kind of gospel would just be of the wisdom of words? It's just about being an eloquent speaker, about tickling people's ears. It's about uh, having a gospel that, that, that makes people feel good. And that's what we've gotten to. We've left the preaching of the true gospel because we're worried about numbers and the cross of Christ is not changing people's lives. I want you to understand what we should be preaching. For the cre preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Here's what I've written down about preaching. We need to preach that people are sinners. They have absolutely no righteousness. If you are here, you were born a sinner. You have absolutely no righteousness. And the judgment of a holy, righteous God hangs over your head. You are on your way to hell as soon as you are born. And if you do not have a life-changing experience with the real God, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for you and rose again, you will be forever condemning yourself to an eternal hell. People need to hear that gospel. But we're afraid that we'll turn somebody off and we're afraid we won't have numbers. But we wonder why churches have no power. We wonder why lives are not being changed. Why our country is not being redirected. God tells you you're a sinner not to condemn you, but to help you know that you are in eternal peril. And I would be doing a disservice to anyone that God cared about and that I care about without saying, you need a Savior. You need a Savior. It's not a, a gospel of self-help. It's not a gospel of, yeah, there's a God out up there and you just help me do better. You need the saving power of Jesus Christ. You need a new soul spirit. You need to be born from above. And it's not a gospel of self-help and, and works and religious activity. I'll send you to hell. We need that preaching of the gospel. It sounds foolishness, but that's what God says will empower. That seems very small to say. You mean just preaching empowered gospel will change people's lives? Romans says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. That word power is dunamis, the word from which we get dynamite. Dynamite was used and is still used to change the landscape of our country, to tear down mountains, to make rivers, to reshape things. And God says the dynamite that changes people's lives is that Jesus saves and there is salvation in no other. It's not just religion, it's the reality of Jesus Christ. Uh, for it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of wives. will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The prudent says, you know, I believe there's a God, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good, and, and I'm a good person. I'm going to work my way to heaven. God says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? Religion will send you to hell. And the wisdom of this world to deal with the problems of mankind is the reason this world is falling apart. For after that it is the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom did not know God. 
It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Do you know what? The preaching of the gospel is so simple that a child can receive it. My children, as best as I understand, trusted Christ between the ages of three and five. It's not rocket science. They knew that they had done bad. They knew that they were sinners. They knew that they had disobeyed. And they knew they deserved punishment. And they believed the truth that Jesus was God and he was the answer for that punishment. And they trusted him as Savior. People think it's foolishness. But for those that are saved by believing, we know it's the power of God. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. I put down here in, in this, I said, uh, the problem with the Jews is we'll be the judge if this is real or not. We want you to show us the power of God and then we'll choose to believe. We'll see, then we'll believe. If you're waiting to see God before you believe, God may not show you himself but he is going to show you your sinfulness. And you're going to know that you need a Savior. And as you trust in the fact that there's no salvation in you, the Jews require a sign. Show us something and then we'll believe. Believe and then you'll see. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. They wanted some self-help plan. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. So I go back to the Mark section in verse 38. Jesus said, I came to preach. When's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? Verse 39, and he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Can I tell you where the power of the gospel is preached? The devil has to go on the run. He cannot stand in a place where the preaching of God's word. I always have said this. If uh, a church is preaching the truth, people will either get right or get out. Because demons can't stand to come to church services week after week where God's power is at work. Verse 40, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, you can make us clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. How many of you, and you, you, don't, you can raise your hand if you want to, how many of you have seen this episode on The Chosen? I have. I tell you, when that guy with the leprosy comes up to Jesus and everybody else is saying, get away, you know, you come closer and we're going to stab you. And Jesus looks at him and he goes up to the man. And the man's broken. He knows that he's got no hope. Unless Jesus does a work in him, there's no hope. And he comes to him and says, if you want to, you can make me clean. I love that scene where Jesus stoops down. I, I don't know if you picked that up. Jesus didn't stand above him as he was there in his leprosy. Jesus stoop, stoops and says, I will. And when he said, I will be thou clean, it, it makes tears when I watch that episode well up in my eyes. Do you know that if you've come to your end of your rope and you know you don't have any hope but Jesus and you say, Jesus, if, do you want to heal me? If you want to, I'll be healed. Jesus wants to heal you. Do you know the heart of God towards you? Do you know what God would do in your life if you would just come humbly like a leper we want to come in our righteousness. We want to come somehow God owing us a blessing, somehow proving to God we're worthy of him doing a miracle on us. It has nothing to do with us except are we just at the end of our rope saying, God, if you want to, you can do a work in me.
you can change everything. And I want you to understand Jesus wants to do a work in you. I want to ask you, is the work being done in you? Then you have to ask yourself, are you coming like this leper? As soon as he spoke, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. I remember in that episode when you see the leprosy being healed on that guy's arm and he's clean. And then they get him a, a clean tunic. I think that's a funny part anyway. That guy is filled with such joy and peace and excitement. Let me ask you, are you as excited about Jesus as the day you first trusted him as Savior? Are you as in love with him as you were when you first claimed him as your Lord? It should grow deeper. It should grow stronger. Verse 43, And straightway he charged him uh, forthwith and sent him away and said unto him, See that thou say nothing to any man. But go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Now, once again, why did Jesus say, don't tell anybody? Don't say anything to anybody. I will tell you why. This man was told to let his changed life do the talking. Jesus was saying, let people observe the change in you. You won't have to tell people you've been healed. They'll see that you've been healed. And so many times we as Christians, we talk a good game but walk a poor one. And Jesus said, you do what you're supposed to and show your life. Show yourself to the priest that they say, this man's clean now. This man's been changed. Can people really tell that you've been changed by the power of God? That you're different? Verse 45, and we'll end with verse 45. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but had to stay out in a desert place, and they came to him from every corner. Do you want your Christianity to point to you? Oh, you say no because you know that's the right answer. But this man said, I want people to see I once was an outcast. Now look at me. I once was uh, uh, rotting flesh and now I... He made it all about himself and about his cleanliness and his righteousness and, and him. God has taught me a, a new truth that I really do use as a yardstick to guard my motive and my heart about serving the Lord in ministry. If I do something to point people to me, I'm in sin. If I'm trying to feed the poor so that people talk about me in this church, I'm in sin. If I'm doing what I'm doing so the focus is me, I am in sin. You can't minister if it's about you. It has to be about him. Because when it's about you, people begin to focus their attention as if you're the answer to their prayer. And you know what? I'm a terrible God. I will fail you. I will make mistakes and... I don't want to. I want you to know that. I don't want to. But if you get your eyes on me, there'll be a time where you're turned off to Christianity. And that's the problem with a lot of people who used to be in churches. They were in churches where people said, look at me, look at me, look at me. And when they failed them, they said, if that's all there is to Christianity, I don't want to have anything to do with it. If that's what a Christian is, I can, I can not go to church on Sunday and be like that. And see, there's no power in ministry like that. It's about him. So when I do something to 
point people to me, I'm in sin. Even if it's church ministry, even if it's preaching this sermon, even if it's singing a song, whatever I do, if it's about pointing to me, it's sin. Abundant life is not about a pointing to abundant life. It's about pointing to Him. And if we're going to minister, Jesus couldn't go into the city anymore. Because where it's about you, Jesus will stand on the outside. When it's about your church or you building it, Jesus will stand on the outside in a desert place. People need him. And so they came to him from every corner. I put, this man should have been silent but surrendered to God's plan for how he should be a witness and testimony. But he made it about him. Are you submissive to what God says, do or not do? Last thing I got. He couldn't go openly into the city, but was in a desert place. And they came to him from every quarter. I go back to this thing. People will always flock to where the real Jesus is. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. They may not all choose him as Savior, but they will be drawn by the power of God to know that God is real, and if they would submit to him, he'd change their life. And then at that point, it's between them and God. But it is our responsibility to live in such a way that Jesus Christ is lifted up, and he will draw all men unto himself. They'll come from every quarter. They will hear. And we're in a world where people don't know what the truth is. They don't know who to believe. Everybody's saying this and that. You lift Jesus Christ up. He'll cut through the darkness and the bull crap and the, the, all the different opinions of men. And people will know that there is a Savior available to him. I want to live that way, and I want this church to be a place that way. Whether we ever grow big or not, I want it to be where people walk through those doors. The real Jesus is here. He changes people's lives. He's done it in our lives and our homes. And it's not about us. We live our life, and our life is a testimony that we've been with Jesus, and we're changed, and he can change them too. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for this church. That's when ministry takes place. That's when doors will open up because people are looking for the real Jesus. Can he be found in your life and can he be found here? Let's pray. Lord, I don't want this to be rhetoric. You know my heart. This world is so needy. There are demons everywhere. There are people with physical sicknesses that are brought on by sin in their life. They've got mental and emotional challenges and stresses and things, and they turn to the things of this world to fix it, and it only makes things worse, and they need you. I know you are the answer. There are people that I love that are on their way to hell that I want them to know that they need you, and you are the answer. Oh, God, may I, may we live in such an authentic, real way that you are clearly seen, you are clearly known, and our lives are the testimony of the differences that you make when people truly do surrender to you. If somebody's here and they don't know you as Savior, oh, God, please let them know their eternal peril that looms over them. But they can be set free from that judgment and know the love and grace of God by just believing that they need Him fully, completely, need you as their Lord and Savior. Do a work in the lives of Christians. Take over this invitation, Lord. Let your power be known. With every head bowed, every eye closed, the 
group's going to sing an invitation song. and If you know it, join in. But make sure you've examined your heart in prayer. Make sure you're praying for God to do a work, not only for the people that are here, but anybody who's watching live streaming so that God can work and move. The more I seek you, the more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet. Drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. The more I seek you, Jesus, the more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe feel your heart beat this love is so deep it's more than i can stand i melt in your peace it's overwhelming i want to sit at your feet drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe feel your heart beat this love is so deep it's more than i can stand and i melt in your peace it's overwhelming we sing that one more time just to know that we want to be in that place with Jesus. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep it's more than i can stand and i melt in your peace it's overwhelming thank you jesus there's a peace that if you don't know jesus you don't know there's a love like nothing you can explain or experience here on earth. It's what you're looking for if you don't know Jesus. Let's stand for dismissal and let people see change lives so that they'll want to know this Jesus that we know. Father, I pray for a spirit of conviction, not condemnation, but conviction to see you there with open arms wanting to meet every need of their heart and life. Lord, may we be ambassadors of that love and that peace as we've allowed it to change us. Love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Don't forget the offering and plate at the back. Thanks for coming.
your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand, and I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming.